Well, greetings, everyone. Um, welcome to the monthly webinar series hosted by the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, also known as the NCCASC, which is based at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, I'm Imtiaz Rangwala, Climate Science Lead at NCCASC. Uh, I'm co-hosting this webinar with uh, Christy miller hassett who is a postdoctoral scientist at NCCASC. Um, we bring you these monthly webinars to facilitate a discussion of science, research, and best practices related to adaptation and resource management under a rapidly changing climate with a focus on the North Central US that encompasses the Missouri and the Upper Colorado River basins. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, a quick word on housekeeping. We are recording this webinar, and you can find all our webinar recordings on our website. During the webinar, all participants will be muted, um, but you'll have the ability to unmute during the Q&A period at the end. Uh, we, however, greatly encourage you to submit your questions and comments uh, uh, through the chat box anytime during the webinar. And we will start with those questions and comments uh, first during the Q&A in the order they are received. Uh, and now I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Keith Musselman. Um, Keith is a research associate at the, at the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research uh, at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, Keith is a hydrologist by training and his work assesses climate change and land cover impacts on freshwater availability, stream flow, and flood risk across a spectrum of scale. Uh, Keith holds a bachelor's in geology from the University of Vermont, a master's in hydrology and water resources from the University of Arizona, and a PhD in civil engineering from UCLA. As a postdoc, he worked from, for the University of Saskatchewan on the topics of forest hydrology and land cover change. Um, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the National Center for Atmospheric Research here in Boulder uh, between 2015 and 2017, where he helped to advance hydrologic modeling of processes in cold regions. Um, in his current work at the University of Colorado Boulder, um, Keith leads uh, multiple large interdisciplinary research projects, including a team of 20 people to assess climate change impacts on indigenous communities in Alaska uh, and the Yukon using a co-production process. Um, Keith has uh, authored about 30 publications, including recent high-profile papers on snowmelt and flood risk in current and future climates. Uh, so Keith, thanks again very much for speaking to us today, and please take it away. Thanks very much, and Christy. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you all for joining today. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, forest impacts on snow water resources, um, and um, particularly with the lens of uh, focus on, on management and climate, climate adaptation possibilities. So as a, as a hydrologist um, or mountain hydrologist, I, I spent a lot of time focused on cold region hydrology, um, where I study really the water and life from snow. Um, snow is important because it, it affects half of the northern hemisphere. It, it, it impacts um, a sixth of the Earth's population. and and has some overlap with a quarter of the GDP um, at, the, at the global scale. Um, so it, it impacts complex systems that are important for, for life as we know it, um, related to the climate, um, to ecology, and to hydrology and water resources. Um, here in the West, mountain snow produces 80% uh, of the stream flow in, in Western North America. Um, and much of that falls uh, in, in the mountains. Um, so it's, it's a benefit and we are heavily reliant upon snow uh, for water for agriculture, irrigation, uh, as well as hydropower. Um, and at the same time, it, it helps, snow helps to cool the climate. Um, the high uh, re reflectivity of snow reflects solar energy back to space, keeping, keeping the climate cooler than it would be without snow. Um, and one of the, the compelling um, things about snow and, and forest is the overlap between the two, um, particularly in the West. And so if you look at this, this map of, of regional forest cover um, compared to, this is just a snapshot from um, MODIS of, of 
snow um, over the landscape, but you can see that much of the same areas that are forested are also the places where we have our mountains and, and deep persistent seasonal snowpack. Um, so under, to understand the extensive regional and local impacts of, of snow and forest on water resources, we need to understand some of the physical processes that, uh, that go on um, that you might experience if you were to walk into a forest during um, snow cover period. And so those range from interception, so the snow that lands on the canopy itself, to attenuation or shading of, of sunlight or solar radiation. That same energy that is shaded is also absorbed by, by the, the canopy, and then that, that thermal heat is, is re-emitted um, back to the, to the environment. Um, and then the cumulative or time integrated impact of all of those processes on determining this highly variable um, impacts of, of forests on both the accumulation of snow water resources, but then subsequently the melt or the mobilization of this, these water resources, making it available. Um, so it's these physical processes that determine how much, when, and where water resources are, are, are born, really. Um, forests are also important for the ecosystem services they provide um, in addition to, to water. Um, so ecosystem services is this, uh, um, defined as the products of, of the functioning natural environment that benefit people. And um, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment defines ecosystem services in, in a number of ways. One is the, the, for the provisioning of, of things like fresh water, of food, of timber, of fiber, of, of medicine, um, as well as the supporting of, of natural and important cycles, including nutrients, um, soil formation in the critical zone, um, and primary productivity. They also, um, forests can, can regulate things like flood control. Um, they provide water purification um, and climate stabilization, as well as crop pollination. Um, they're in, um, important for cultural reasons. They provide uh, recreational opportunities and, and spiritual engagement uh, and educational opportunities, as well as um, just the aesthetic um, value that people have uh, related to forests. So those are, those are the, one of the, some of the reasons why forests are important for our society. Um, so understanding ecosystem services in these mountainous environments, and particularly as they relate um, to the, the forests requires considerations of these snow forest interactions, particularly because um, much of our precipitation in our headwaters where ma majority of our stream flow originates um, interacts with falls of snow and interacts with these forests. And the system is complex. This is a, a time lapse of, of from a camera mounted looking at a snow telemetry site where we ob observe, this is a, a Natural Resource Conservation Service or NRCS um, site above Boulder, Colorado, um, below Niwot Ridge. And um, this camera is going, is, I'm gonna play a time lapse of the imagery um, taken um, hourly at the site, starting in the spring, we're in April, that time ticking along in, on the upper left. You can see that the dynamics, this is the springtime. So we've got melt going on. We're interspersed with, with dynamic um, uh, snowfall events that, that accumulate in the canopy and then subsequently um, ablate or melt away. Um, and we get dynamic uh, radiation. So solar radiation that is melting the snow and the snow disappears first um, underneath the trees in this case, and then expands um, toward that, that sensor. In this case, we're measuring using a weighing device that the, the snowpack at this site in, that, in the middle of this little clearing, but you can see that there are patches that remain in the snow. So this, the system is incredibly dynamic. And when we um, model uh, this process across large forested regions like the Western US, um, these are the processes that we just observed that we need to incorporate. One of the big ones is, is this interception. And so uh, much of the snow that is intercepted by the canopy is lost uh, to the atmosphere via sublimation. Um, and the amount is, is, is not very well known, um, particularly when you think about large regions and complex um, ecotones. Um, this is information from the Southern Boreal Forest um, measured, uh, reported by John Pomeroy and co-authors from a 1999 paper. Um, and they looked at the percent of, of total seasonal snowfall that is lost uh, via canopy sublimation. You can see that 
these thinner forests like the mixed spruce and aspen that don't have the leaves on them in the winter um, might might lose about 13 percent of the annual snowfall to sublimation whereas mature and denser spruce forests can lose up to 40 percent of the annual snowfall um, back to the atmosphere um, so that that is water resources that is fully realized um, so these concept that the denser forests have less snow beneath the canopy um, and less of that is is um, available to be mobilized um, and so that there's this I spent a lot of time thinking about the forest structure with this overhead view of, of forest gaps and and relationship between the atmosphere and the climate and the the surface um, and there are a lot of ties to other disciplines as well so in thinking about those who focus on uh, groundwater and and recharge and soil moisture and um, Logical productivity, um, as well as soil production. Um, this, this is this is an important viewpoint of of the forests themselves. Um, at the same time, the forests have complex feedbacks uh, with the environment. Um, in, in this case, across the West, you see that these there there is heterogeneity in where forests um, kind of grow and set up. Um, and there's this correlation between water, energy, and vegetation um, that is complex and distributed over the landscape, um, de dependent in some cases on aspect, um, slope, and, and um, soils. And this, this environmental condition that determine the suitability of the environment for the forests. In turn, those forests specify the, the, the local environmental conditions and in, in, in some cases, it's uh, related to soil moisture, um, but it can also be the types of, of the organic material in the soils. And, um, and then, so, so to the, the accumulation of snowpack, which ultimately then feeds back into that soil moisture and the subsidy of, of moisture throughout the growing season for these, these, these plants. And so there are complex environmental processes involved and we we apply our eco hydrologic models um, to these conditions they work really well when these conditions are homogeneous so you can imagine uh, here a gradient of forest cover now they don't work as well as you increase the heterogeneity um, so in this case you ha might have disturbances or you might have a natural variability um, such as forest gaps and so these models are not fully designed to treat those heterogeneities um, and they impact things like the water yield, the, the, the species diversities, the recruitment and the carbon dynamics, um, as well as a number of socioeconomics, uh, uh, socioeconomic concerns and considerations. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, forest gap theory as it relates to snow hydrology. Um, and forest gaps are designed as breaks in the overhead canopy. Um, so you can imagine this uh, synthetic cylinder shaped circular gap in the forest and they're often expressed as a function as a function of tree height in this case the gap diameter is two times the local tree height um, so we can create a forest gap and um, imagine in in theory that we would now be reducing that interception of snowfall and maximizing our accumulation um, and at the same time we are the, the forest gap is providing shade um, so that that snowpack is now shaded uh, from sun exposure so we can minimize sun exposure or solar radiation and ultimately prolong that seasonal snow cover and 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 the melt um, so we often find um, that these forest gaps are are some of the last places to melt out and that there is potentially an optimal gap size that is the function of the solar angle so it's a function of the time at which snow melts, it's a function of the latitude and a function of the slope and aspect. Um, at the same time, forest gaps offer benefits beyond snow hydrology. And um, so we see that there's a, there's a variety of microenvironments and forest gaps that facilitate diverse communities of, of insects, of animals and of vegetation. And those forest gaps are increasingly being used as a measure metric of, of biodiversity. So we can remotely sense these forest gaps very easily. Today, we have LIDAR, we have satellite remote sensing at very high resolutions, and we can use that relationship between what, what is measured at the plot scale and presence of these forest gaps as a measure of biodiversity. And I think there's some reason 
uh, there are a number of reasons related to water and energy as to why that is. They provide this micro refugia. So they provide locations over very short distances with favorable local climate conditions amidst, amidst uh, unfavorable regional conditions. So in some cases, something like an ecotherm might only need to move a little bit, you know, on the order of meters to, to drastically change the local, um, the local climate, the microclimate, um, and that can be really beneficial to, to insects and, and, and at-risk species. To understand these, these kind of processes, uh, there's been a lot of work um, in experimental forests uh, as, as Amitaz has mentioned, I, I did a postdoc um, in Saskatchewan where I was based in Alberta and I was working at the Marmot Creek Experimental Forest. Um, and here there, there was some work done creating in the um, 1970s and early 1980s, these, these honeycomb patterns of, of forest gaps, which you can kind of see in the upper left of that, that image, as well as some larger cut blocks. And so they, they asked, in, this, this question that, that could force manipulations modify stream flow. And these small forest clearings were found to increase accumulation. Um, and um, Golden and, and Swanson were two researchers who, who worked heavily on this, on this area. And they found that, that the impacts on the snowmelt rates depend on clearing size, on slope and aspect, and that these manipulations that they conducted had relatively modest impacts on runoff timing and variability. Um, and only local impacts on stream flow volume. And one of the challenges was that their, um, their slope and aspect of this, of this catchment wasn't quite right to, to maximize and, and, and potentially produce greater stream flow. So if they could repeat this again with a, in a different, land, different way, and different, um, that they, they concluded that um, they might have had a different result. Um, so too, we, we had these same kind of forest manipulations at the Fraser Experimental Forest, excuse me, in Colorado, um, outside of Winter Park, where they created these clusters of trees and they essentially reduced um, forest density and found, uh, Troendo found that pre and post treatment, you actually increase the stream flow, you get stream flow to flow earlier. Um, however, there are some challenges to, to doing these works in, in this work in, uh, a robust manner because each year is going to be different. The snow, snow patterns and accumulation and precipitation and temperature is going to be different year to year. So it's, it's very different, difficult to conduct a controlled experiment. These are very costly experiments to, to conduct. And we can hypothesize that to an extent, these natural systems self-manage these resources that um, on the left here is a, a, a picture of a, a th the thin spacing of a managed um, forest in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and then on the right, um, this is an example of, of forest die-off during the recent California drought um, of 2015. And um, so that posed the question, has, has fire suppression and great forest density stifled our water resources in the West um, and the resilience uh, of forests to provide ecosystem services? And certainly there have been a number of studies that have shown that this, has, this is the case um, in some places and there are other, other places with where fire dynamics are different and, and that may not necessarily be the case. So it's, it's, it's a little more complex than I'm making it out to be here. Um, in addition, there are um, complex disturbances that, that are emerging. So emergent, emerging disturbances. Um, in this case, we're looking um, for Google Earth. You can pull this up on your phone. You're west of Edmonton, Alberta. So it's in the Canadian Rockies, the foothills, very analogous to the front range um, of Colorado. And we're looking here at these large, maybe 150 meter diameter wide um, oil and gas pads that have been, they have bring in a bulldozer, they, they pull off the, the topsoil, they cut down the trees, um, they spread industrial grasses, and these are really semi-permanent landscape features from here on. And this is, this is emerging because it's only um, the, been the last 20 years or so that these have shown up. And I'm gonna zoom out to show you the scale in which you start to zoom out, you see these thin lines. These are seismic exploration lines that oil and gas companies use to, to determine where to drill the next um, well pads. Um, and then here you can see the Athabasca River, which drains to, um, drains to the north and, and east to the Hudson Bay. We, we zoom out further, you can start to see cut blocks. Uh, and even further, you get to the, the, the scale at which um, we start as hydrologists and eco-hydrologists and 
land managers to scratch our heads and say, well, how in the world do we do we deal with this kind of heterogeneity? Our, our models simply aren't designed to, to treat these, these systems. And so we're moving towards trying to, to understand what these fine scale dynamics and, and processes mean at the larger scales uh, for stakeholders and decision makers. Um, and the, the fine scale snow and, and hydrologic models and eco, eco hydrologic models are really in their infancy. Um, recent advances are promising. This is a, a, a model that was put that is being developed uh, at the University of Arizona by Patrick Broxton and co-authors um, called Snow Palm. Um, but there are many others that are emerging that are that are like this um, that can use information from very detailed one meter resolution um, lidar imagery, or lidar remote sensing of, of forest structure to inform um, these fine scale processes. Um, there, but at the same time, there's a community need to verify the process representation. What would have worked at very large landscape unit scales um, may not work when you start breaking it down to the scales of individual trees. And so there's a community need to verify this at new scales. And there's a, a need to develop similar techniques to improve not just the snow modeling, but the, but the, um, the vegetation demography. So the, the growth, the life cycles, and the death of, of forest vegetation. Um, to improve the hydrology and the, and the water resource models. And, um, and in some cases, new analytical methods are going to be required to, to move this, um, into, into production. And um, so this kind of this community vision for a new model framework that is a virtual experimental forest. Um, and that really would need to be co-developed with decision makers to support management decisions. Um, need to be able to consider multiple objectives related to water yield, to climate and drought and fire resilience, to ecological diversity, and, and mostly to resources. So we have uh, limited resources available and, and um, the, the possibility to make decisions. Um, and so how do you use those limited resources informed by you know, a, a, a new um, virtual experimental forest model um, to, to inform uh, the best um, decisions. And, and how do we, we, so with this kind of framework, we can test hypotheses and decisions that are too costly to experiment, um, to implement experimentally. So we can't, we can't afford to keep repeating these long-term experimental forests in different environments um, because they, they take too long and they are very costly. And we, but we need to, we need to better, better understand these interactions among climate, forest, fire, water, biogeochemistry. Um, so just I'm going to give some examples of how these algorithms um, are, are being informed to, to, bring, to bring to bear on this problem. And I did this work as a postdoc, at, again, at the Marmot Creek Experimental Forest, where I work in one of the small clearings um, in, in, to understand the variability of water energy um, and plant phenology. So we have a number of different observations and the one that I'll point out here is, is snow depth. And so we have a snow sensor that is measuring continuously the snow depth in the center of the clearing and another one in the forest, just um, some number of tens of meters away. Um, and again, that difference about 40% uh, between snow depth in the, in the clearing versus what you find in the, in the continuous forest. But interestingly, they, the snow despite that difference in magnitude, they melt at about the same time because of the difference in the melt rate. So you get much uh, faster melt in, in the clearing than you do in the forest, for example, in this environment. Um, you can make the same measurements here, just repeated um, snow pit observations on the sunlit side or the, the side of the clearing that gets the most sun is the warmest and it's something in between, but in the end it melts out at about the same date. Um, however, when you go to the shaded edge of this forest clearing, um, you can you can see that there's much more snow. The seasonal maximum um, value occurs now um, well more than a month after the other locations, and it persists for almost a month longer um, on that shaded edge. And so the, this has been termed by some as as a cold hole phenomenon. And you can see this in both in infrared um, photos of of the two sites. They were looking at the sunlit side on the, on the top and the shaded side at the bottom, both, as well as the visible camera on the, on the right. And you can see that these, these trunks can, can exceed 40 degrees Celsius um, 
and um, this, is, this is a very hot edge of this forest gap, whereas you turn around and face the other direction, you get a very shady edge, it doesn't see direct solar radiation, um, and, and that snow persists longer. Um, at the same time, you can take measurements of things like the, the trunk and the wood temperatures and the needle temperatures, which um, a model, a surface model would need to be able to, to um, understand. And this, uh, this is a, a paper that um, John Palmer and I published um, looking at, the, at these and, and being able to model them. Uh, so then going back to think about this forest gap, we can now conceptualize, for example, um, conceptualize this gap as a cylinder. Um, a circle, and you can play some games with with a, a model that can treat or, or estimate the, these dynamics. And so, some of the dynamics are um, long wave, uh, short wave radiation. So, long wave is the thermal, or um, thinking about um, like a, a a wood stove and the the emission of heat, which you can't see but you can feel. Same happens in the in the forest or in, in the natural environment. Um, short wave radiation is a solar radiation, and then there's turbulence, so the, the wind energy transfer. Um, and we can do this between needles and between trunks, and then ultimately estimate what the snow surface receives or the soil surface receives. And for this talk, I'm just going to ignore the turbulence because that is a, a whole nother talk. Um, so here we're just going to measure um, the turbulence at the, at the ground level and specify that. Um, so that that net short wave at the at the snow surface is a combination of what's directly received by the sun uh, at the surface, um, and so you can we can model using a ray tracing technique the likelihood of a direct beam passing through our cylinder our cylindrical gap, and then the diffuse beam is the is really a, a function of the fraction of the sky that you can see when you're looking directly overhead. So that is the again a, a, a fracture. A, of the of the gap diameter as well as the surrounding forest um, and with this information we can now model uh, the soil radiation across this uh, uh, this forest gap from the shaded side to the sunlit side and get a sense of what the solar radiation is and very interestingly the, the thermal radiation is, is very dynamic um, between those two areas particularly compared to the above canopy measured at, on a tall tower um, which is that dashed line at the bottom of those plots. Um, and so the model is needed to, to predict what that thermal radiation would look like um, it, along this transect of this, this disturbance. Um, and you can see that the model compared to the measure, the blue compared to the red, uh, can actually resolve the dynamics quite well. So then with a, with a model that is kind of flexible in, in its treatment of forest gaps, we can look, we can move these gaps to different latitudes. Um, we can um, simulate differences in um, the season, winter to spring. And we can understand how, what happens as we change the size or the orientation of these gaps, um, as well as move it to different slopes and aspects. And um, in general, it, we found, which is consistent with other, other studies, similar studies, uh, found that a gap diameter of about 0 0.5, so half of the tree height, um, is, is able to minimize the solar radiation and minimize our net radiation, which is the, the main driver of, of snow melt um, in these environments, um, compared to something that is um, smaller. So as, it, as that gap gets smaller, um, the trees become denser and, and uh, there's actually increasing long wave radiation. Um, whereas if it gets larger, you get more solar radiation um, and increase in that net radiation. So you can minimize that net radiation. Um, so we can model this, take this into model space and look at the, at the 2D maps of the net short wave radiation on the left, the net long wave radiation in the middle and the net total radiation. Um, that short wave plus long wave on the right. And you can see the simulation of the, that hot edge on the north side of the gap and the cold edge on the south side of the gap. And now we can play some games where, where we change the, the size of, the, of that clearing. And at, at some point you get to one times the tree height and you start to see that there's very little um, energy, uh, minimal energy in the center of that gap. And as you get smaller and smaller, there's that, that in, the impact of that gap becomes smaller. Um, you can also do the same thing with any shape. You can do polygons, you can do ellipsoids, and you can do linear disturbances such as roads. Um, and you can take it a step further and we can, you can visit some of the techniques that Hollywood uses to, to um, create, you know, for example, their Disney animation or 
um, or Pixar, um, where they are doing really complicated ray tracing. And now we have the, the techniques and, and we have LIDAR based in infrastructure to be able to do this, apply these techniques to our environment and conduct this ray tracing um, of, the, of the environment using structure measured from the, the LIDAR. Um, so we can get that same sky view or we can point in the direction of the sun and, and see what the, the likelihood of solar radiation is and, and long radiation. We can now look at um, a model that, that does this um, for the winter. This is um, a, a forest in the Tuolumne River Basin of, of California, the Sierra Nevada. On the left is the winter and on the right, this is a, a single day play in, in animation. On the right is the late spring. And what one of the things you can see in the in the solar radiation um, is is the emergence of those canopy gaps, particularly in the late spring, as the sun angle gets higher, and um, those gaps become more relevant from an energy water perspective um, compared to the winter when they're more shaded. And so we can do this um, at uh, with to to look at the total net radiation. And this is a, a application in the Sequoia National Park region, um, where we're those. I'm not sure you can quite see it. We're looking at about a kilometer by a kilometer, but those little blue dots are the location of individual trees. These are large red fir trees in Sequoia National Park. And they produce these really interesting um, hot spots and, so, and, and cold holes. And so one question is how do we retain this kind of critical information? And when is it important to retain that at regional and at macro system scales? And so we get these hot spots and hot moments. There might be times when this level of detail is, is important. There will be other times where it's not. And so how can the fine scale dynamics that we know exist but haven't been able to fully realize to date um, be scaled to support the parsimonious or the efficient simulations of, of these dynamics at, at regional to global scales? Um, and interestingly, now we don't need LIDAR. We've, we've got um, on our phones, we've got 3D vegetation structure, um, which we can visualize in Google Earth. Um, this is just a, a scan of, of the Lawrence Berkeley lab, for example, just moving, moving around on your phone and, and understanding the structure of the, of the vegetation. You can, as well as the disturbances, you can do the same thing um, for any region at regional to continental scales. And now we have very high resolution global uh, commercial satellite systems that can now apply that to at, at the global scale. There isn't any place now where we can't get very detailed vegetation structure. Um, and so this is this is all kind of part of a community-led vision and, and one one component of that moving towards large-scale hydrologic and earth system models being applied to improve forecasts and to improve future projections of water resources. Um, this is an animation of the SUMA model out of NCAR um, conducted by Andy Wood. Um, and then on the right, this is um, Martin Clark uh, routing. Um, so the, the, the big animation is soil moisture. And so we can, you can imagine that there are periods of drought as we run through this, this annual cycle. And then on the right is the, is the realization of, of that water being routed to rivers and streams. And we can you now do this uh, at very detailed grouped response units. So getting down to the, to the areas that, that matter for, um, for decision makers. Um, and we're moving in the direction of being able to do this um, in a way that, that resolves the heterogeneity of the landscape. Um, but this, the, the advances in the model and the, the remote sensing accuracy, while it's advancing, it still needs to be grounded by empiricism. And by, by that, I mean observations on the ground. And it needs to be guided by stakeholders to, in order to gain the trust uh, and to encourage um, use. And that's one of the big challenges. And so I'm happy to, to share that we, we recently got a, a, a large grant from the National Science Foundation at CU Boulder. Um, and I'm leading this effort to, to co-define climate change refugia in, in forested headwaters to inform effective management of these, of these headwater systems. And so when we talk about climate change refugia, similar to what I described um, at the micro scale, 
climate change refugia are these mappable landscape units that are buffered from climate change to enable the persistence of, of physical, ecological, and sociocultural resources. And that's a definition from Tony Morelli. Um, and so this overarching research question of this project is, is can, can we use society's values of, of these ecosystems? So sociocultural values, stakeholder needs, and scientific advent, uh, advances to, to co-define, to map, and to project the emergence of climate change refugia for headwater ecosystem services at this urban wildland interface in the Colorado Front Range. Um, and so we're gonna be imagining that, that, that these are again, delineable landscape units and that there is some overlap between what the public values, what stakeholders consider, and what scientists are capable of simulating and so this vision is this, that again, this refugia are delineable. Um, they can be modeled, they can be measured. Um, they're, they're to some extent shaped by human behavior and linked to the values of society. Um, and so we'll be conducting um, surveys of populations to understand the preferences um, of, of different groups in the front range corridor. And these could be land users, but they don't necessarily need to be. They could be people who just simply value the presence of, of ecosystems and, and certain attributes of, of forests, for example, or grasslands that, that um, they're willing to, to support. And, and ultimately these are taxpayers that we're talking about. Um, so very relevant to understand their needs. And then we're partnering with decision makers, uh, people with the Forest Service, the National Park Service, um, a number of open space manage management organizations, um, including the, um, including a number of, of counties where a majority of Coloradans live um, it, across, across the region. Um, and this concept that refugia are temporary, um, that projections of when and at what level of warming are co-defined refugia persists or, or face risk is, is going to be used to separate non-refugial areas from climate change refugia. And that, I think that's rather compelling because then if you have limited resources, uh, a, a management agency or an entity might choose to, to allocate those resources in different ways, depending on the guidance um, of, of, some of, these, of some of these models. Um, again, to do that, we're, we're going to be looking at, at ways to, to improve upon how we make measurements of these gradients. Um, and so we're, we've proposed to, to bring in this tram measurement system that um, we'll build up in the, in the Como Creek basin of, of um, below Niwot Ridge in Colorado. So it's about 40 miles west of Boulder um, in, in a forest where we have um, a, a number, a long-term research program. Um, and this tram system will move back and forth along this gradient um, from dry and, and thin soils um, and sparse forest vegetation and undergrowth to perennially wet meadows. It'll move back and forth across the season and, and be able to detect um, co-located options of, of hydrometeorology, of geophysical and biogeochemical soil states um, and plant and tree ecology. It's gonna do that using this mobile instrumentation, co-located study plots and surface and subsurface remote sensing techniques. We're bringing a number of different disciplines to bear to understand how well these earth system models can, can treat these dynamics, um, all the while including um, uh, our, our stakeholders. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so then we're, we've proposed to, to work closely with NCAR as a collaborator, uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research located here in Boulder, um, and we're going to be coupling a number of different earth system models um, that treat things like hill slope connectivity, realizing that, that um, stream flow doesn't just materialize from snow, we have to route it. And the landscape connectivity is really a determinant in how that water and when that water becomes available at the stream. Um, this hill slope connectivity and treating the heterogeneity of the landscape is critical. And we'll be doing that within the, the um, CLM or the land surface model, the community land model. Um, and then um, engaging a dynamic ecosystem simulator that was developed by the Department of Energy and is now being um, worked on at NCAR um, that treats the demography of the of forest vegetation, the growth and the depth of, this, of these trees at his 
and this, this model has originated really in the tropics and it's now we're, we're proposing to work with a number of the developers to to test and, and implement this in, in, the, in the rocky mountains um, and then this whole system will be forced not just with a single realization of potential future climate but large large ensembles of, of potential future climate downscaled to the front range um, which allows us to think about this this idea of emergence so so thinking about a tipping point or a threshold at which um, something that is relevant to stakeholders and to the public is is no longer viable and um, or, or sustainable and what are the points and when are they reached for different units of the landscape and so one way to kind of visualize that is, is this example where we um, say we go out and, and conduct these surveys and maybe one of the um, responses that is prominent is I like to, to walk along a forested stream or I, I value forests in, in, with, a, with a perennial stream. Um, and you might turn to a stakeholder and the stakeholder says, yes, you know, that's, that's relevant to me. I need to reduce sediment loads by X percent and turn to somebody else and they say, yes, and, you know, I, I see that too. We need to ensure that they, we have these forested buffers along the river corridors. Um, and so then this is an example of a co-developed research question. We can ask how likely is historical forest structure along riparian corridors to change this century? Um, and then the deliverable might be a co-produced estimate of refugia. And so on the left is this circle. And we're thinking about upper elevations as smaller circles in the middle and lower elevations being the broader um, out outer rings of the circles and different aspects around it. And so you can imagine this, the earth system model being running over, over this, being run over this region and summarized in a way that is approachable um, to stakeholders and, and say, okay, what is the likelihood of a threshold that we have code defined being exceeded? Is it high, is it moderate, is it low? And what is the level of, of global warming at which, and regional warming at which that, that threshold is, is, is um, met or exceeded? And so you'd have this high, moderate, low potential refugia. Um, and so that's that, that um, refugia might be green in this case, the upper elevations or the north facing slopes, for example, for, for forest structure uh, in riparian corridors. Um, and then vulnerable sections would be the orange and the red for, for regional aspects and elevations over time to inform these, uh, ultimately to inform management decisions. So it's, it's a first step at, at this, it's a complex project and um, we're, we have a lot of people working in different disciplines, um, but it's but it's exciting to to bring this to bear. Um, so, in summary, the forests influence snow by reducing um, snow accumulation via canopy interception losses, and they delay snowmelt via shading. And overly dense forests reduce snow accumulation and, and stream flow. Um, forest manipulations and management provide multiple benefits. Um, decisions need to be made judiciously and informed by process-based models, um, which may or may not exist today, um, but, but definitely need to be co-developed across disciplines and um, in close collaboration with stakeholders. So that I think there's great need for a community-developed forest model capable of resolving variability in water, energy, and plant physiology that is equally relevant to scientists, to stakeholders, and and um, societal values. And so this is really a, a community science challenge that you know, I, I, I recognize that there are a number of papers that I uh, probably overlooked or didn't cite in this talk. Um, rest assured that I am, I am watching closely and please reach out to me if there's anything that, that I should be, with, may, be made aware of. And if there's any interest in engaging um, in, in these kinds of, of projects in the future. Um, it's really a, a community science challenge from, from multiple um, perspectives. And so thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Great. Uh, thank you, Keith. That was, uh, that was excellent. Um, uh, we have a lot of time for questions. Um, and uh, you should be able to unmute. Uh, and in fact, also uh, show your video if you want at this point of time. So I'll just open it up. Uh, if you have questions, please go ahead. <laughs> 
and you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, let me know if you can't. Maureen, please go ahead. Yes, um, fabulous presentation, Keith. Thank you so much for um, your detailed description. Um, question for you. Um, have you considered working with um, some native tribal communities that have managed their own forests? Because many, well, the tribal communities I'm closest with are um, in the Salish Kootenai and they have extensive forest management um, programs there. And um, when they manage by traditional practices, they um, result in uh, the, uh, they, they produce these refugia concepts, um, not intentionally for the things that you're looking at, but in order to maximize um, understory vegetation for tr traditional species, create habitat, um, it, it do things differently. They manage in a, a way very different from uh, the standard US Forest Service models. Um, have you uh, considered looking at those as um, a comparison to see how they um, appear in your uh, water retention models? Yeah, I, Maureen, thanks for that question. I think that's that's in incredibly important. Um, you know, we I, I have a number of uh, other projects, one particularly in Alaska and the Yukon where we are, are using um, co-production with indigenous groups, uh, First Nations and tribal um, organizations um, to, to really understand climate impacts on salmon and rivers. But, uh, and, and so what, what that has imparted on me is the importance of listening and understanding um, traditional knowledge um, and bringing that to bear on, on these problems. And I, I hadn't considered that um, in terms of the forests, but it's, it's really compelling. And I totally can see given my experience in Alaska on, on, a, on a separate topic, but it, it, that, that sometimes this, this new perspective from a Western science perspective, that, that, that it, it can totally change how you, how you approach a problem. I'd love, to, I'd love to see these models get a little bit more buy-in with, with larger agencies, and then, and then think about how we can use co-production and, and to, to better understand what metrics and what practices um, are, are tried and true. And many times I think we'll learn a lot from listening to elders and indigenous organizations. Excellent, thanks Keith. I'll follow up with you. Please do. Well, thank you for that question. Um, Keith, we have a question from Dominique Bachelet. Um, and the question is like uh, the earth system models or even watershed models do not necessarily include the impacts of pest outbreaks and fire. So do you have enough data to help calibrate those models with realistic simulation of those secondary effects of warming? Yeah, that's a great question and and relevant criticism. So I think that I think that they these models now do um, start to start to simulate um, forest forest fire. You know that the land surface models now um, include the ability to have maybe not dynamic but specified forest fire effects, but they're certainly not. Most of these, I think, are are at research levels and rather than operational levels. And so, I think they again are are somewhat in their infancy. In, infancy, um, and there's much to do, much to learn about um, how to incorporate that. I think, particularly from our perspective in the Front Range, you know, we've seen these stand replacing fires, um, and they're very rapid. I don't know that that we are treating those appropriately in our earth system models, um, rather than just going through and, and specifying an area that becomes disturbed and then watch how that responds accordingly. But you're right, like we're, we're not there yet with land surface models and, and being able to do that, certainly not at the continental to global scale reliably. 
Thanks. Uh, I see a hand from Luis. Uh, Luis, would you like to go ahead? Uh, ask your question. Yes, uh, I'm Louis Pervache. I'm with the Nature Louis. Conservancy. Uh, the question I have is, we're very interested in this topic with the Colorado River program. One of the things we discovered, um, like have a lot of jack of all trades like myself who um, know enough to get into trouble, but are not experts in anything. And we discovered very rapidly that um, the hydrologic models uh, treat vegetation very primitively, like forests, shrubs, herbaceous, and bare ground. And that's it. That, and the models we do for, we do simulations of vegetation management state transition models for large, very large landscapes, very detailed stuff. And we're working with 300 thematic combinations for both ecological systems combined with different successional stages of vegetation and whether it's invaded by non-native species or you know whatever. So there's a profound disconnect between what we can do for land management simulations and what we can do for the vegetation component of hydrological models. The hydrological models are pretty nice and detailed for the physical processes of hydrology, but they're, they're just ludicrous, simplistic when it comes to the the representation of vegetation. And this is about, you know, canopy cover. So how, how far are we from having hydrologic models that are process-based that can predict flows um, with com more complex vegetation? And just to you, we, we're using the basin characterization model, which is not a flow model, it's a water balance model, because we can actually get to that level of detail with it but we would like to have a process-based flow model to make you know, predictions of flow that would stand in, in court with litigation and all that, which will happen with force management. So how far are we from there, given where you're headed with this grant and all that? Yeah, thanks, Louis. Um, you know, I think this would be a great question for someone like Dave Lawrence or Rosie Fisher at NCAR, who are our, um, um, our, our close collaborators. Um, and developers of, of some of these these land surface models, in terms of the hydrology models, I, I agree. I think I think really vegetation is conceptualized essentially as straws. You know that that that, that they're under underrepresented in terms of the the complexity, the ties to issues of carbon sequestration and 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 um, yeah, even even evapotranspiration. Um, I think. I think that what, where we're trying to go is to bring in the Bates model, this um, functional assemblage or, or forest demography model where, where we can actually specify the species um, that are on the ground. Um, and you could use the, you know, um, multispectral or hyperspectral imagery if you have it available or, or whatever, um, uh, whatever survey information you have to, to populate those models. The challenge right now is, is moving those models from the tropics where they're developed and, and they're working pretty well to places like the Rocky Mountains. And, and, and you know, so right now we're, we're facing issues of, of or, or, or the developers are facing issues of uh, getting the, the parameters right for a new tree species. Um, and, and I think that, I think there's a substantial amount of work to get to a point where a hydrologic model is coupled with a dynamic vegetation model Again, that's not my area of expertise, but I recognize the challenge that you're describing. Great. Um, question from Liz Payton. Um, uh, can you give an example of integrating a local, uh, maybe take Colorado, specific community value in your modeling efforts? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so I think that you know, the, the example that I gave at the end there was this, this, this idea of a riparian, a forested riparian corridor. So, you know, I think it, it would be interesting. I can't speak to the values, um, but, but increasingly as, as our summers get hotter um, and the, the Rocky Mountains become a place of, of climate refuge, of, of places where people go to, to escape the heat, for example, you know, if it's 105 degrees in Denver, and they can travel two hours away and, and get to a place where it's 75 degrees, you know, that could be a value. So there could be value to a landscape um, that may or may not even be forested, 
but just harbors a different climate and gives them some respite from from the crippling heat that we're, we're you know experiencing in some of our urban corridors and, and rural corridors um and so i think that's that's an example of a value that that the mountains might provide but but beyond that i think that there are others um, regarding hunting um regarding uh forestry there may be value in some communities to being able to provide sustained forestry practices which provides jobs for communities and i think those are just a couple of that, that come to mind but thanks thanks for that question i hope that answered it Thank you, Pete. Uh, any other questions? Um, we can take a one, one or two more questions. Keith, I'll, I'll maybe insert one question here. Um, you know, uh, in doing climate adaptation work, I come across this kind of theme of develop, creating climate resilient landscapes. Uh, and one example would be, hey, our forests are quite dense. We need to tend them, right? Not only uh, for reducing wildfire risk, but maybe creating opportunities for biodiversity. Um, and it, it's related to your climate refugia thinking. And, um, and so, yeah, so do you think that the thinning practice, that the thinning piece going forward is a good opportunity to kind of bring in the science you talked about of how to thin it appropriately, at least from the snow piece, but then maybe integrate it with, optimize it with uh, the, the ecological processes. Yeah. I think that's I think that's exactly where it needs to be, and it needs to be done mechanistically. It needs to be done. Those decisions need to be made considering all of those objectives, um, and many of them are really compelling. The the biodiversity is compelling. The water resources, if you're able to eke out an additional ten or twenty percent of stream flow, that's that's very substantial. Um, and and but I don't know that we. You know, collectively we can can inform those decisions and and really you know stand them up in court for example and say we we know to the best of our ability and within this confidence interval that this decision will minimize fire risk or this decision will optimize stream flow i'm not sure we can say that yet perhaps in the future um, there's one last question i'll take at this point uh, from louis uh, and uh, the question is, the presentation was about gaps. What about forest thinning from closed 60% cover to open canopies, 30% cover on the north slopes? Um, yeah, no, that's, that's another, an, another great question and a good example um, of, of, how you can, of how you can think about different decisions on different parts of the landscape that would have beneficial results. Um, and you know this the north slope versus the south slope uh, is is an important example um, and so yeah going from a 60 percent closed canopy to something that is more open and gappy that you might experience or might might find in a place that sees frequent fire moving through um, could uh, yeah could could provide the same kind of benefits as very small gaps on a south facing slope, for example. And so you may be able to actually do more harvesting on on a north facing slope um, to get the same effect as you would on the south facing slope. But you know then you have to consider multiple objectives as well. Well, we are at our closing time. And, um, and thank you very much, Keith, again, for an excellent presentation and this great discussion that followed. Um, uh, well, take care, everyone. We hope to see you at our next webinar, uh, which will be next month. Uh, see you then. Thank you all.